friends and I uh, were pastors, we used to joke about this text and say, well, maybe if we told people that we wanted to transfigure something in the church, they'd be a little more open to it than if we said we wanted to change something in the church. Because to transfigure something means to make it, to elevate it, and make it more glorious, and uh, who would be against that, right? Because <laughs> um, we like things that are more glorious and wonderful. And if we're honest, that's how we like Jesus. Um, we like Jesus and we want Jesus to be all glorious and shining and up on that mountaintop, just chatting it up with some old long dead prophets where, you know, life is shining and happy and nice. But wanting Jesus that way and actually getting Jesus that way isn't always quite the same thing. I mean, let's face it. If the gospel message is all about Jesus wandering around, being all shiny, and, you know, talking to a bunch of dead prophets, uh, we probably would have a hard time relating to him just a little bit. I think that... Uh, that, that would be a problem. But talking about Jesus as both human and divine is always kind of a tricky matter because we can imagine and we can understand the human parts because it's what we see every day. The divine part, on the other hand, that gets a little more out there for us. I mean, we like it. We love the idea. We want it. We just simply relate better to the man who walks and who talks, who laughs and who cries right along with us. It's the image of God that is, of course, more accessible and tangible and real through the person of Jesus Christ. Yet at times, it's also what makes us lose sight at times of who and what he is, which is. God, what happens on this mountaintop gives us a glimpse of that something beyond. Gives us a glimpse of something beyond what we see in our everyday lives. Gives us the full reality of who and what Jesus is. He is both divine and human. So it sparks our imagination. And we try to visualize it. We try to visualize what actually that might have looked like. But it's so outside of our experience. And our only frame of reference tends to be whatever Hollywood has come up with to try and portray what the glory of God might actually look like. So what happens on this mountaintop is hard for us to imagine as much as we try to grasp and hang on to that. And yet it is a pivotal point in the story of Jesus, because up to this point, Jesus has just sort of been sitting back and letting others talk about who he is and what they think, asking his disciples, so, you know, what are people saying about me? Who do they say I am? Well, some say you're John the Baptist. Oh, others think you're Elijah. And then there's Peter who hits the nail on the head. He says, you are the Messiah, the Holy One of God. So, good for Peter. He nailed it. I don't think even Peter really understood what he meant when he said that. Because it's one thing to know it. It's one thing to acknowledge it. It's something else entirely to <coughs> see it. When I went to Egypt, I had an idea of the grandeur of the pyramids and the how huge the temples were at Karnak and Luxor, but until I was actually there and I was standing beside them, all the pictures, all the descriptions, they just kind of paled in comparison to actually being there, standing there right next to the real thing, to actually seeing and marveling at how huge these ancient structures actually were. I think that's kind of what happened to the disciples on that mountaintop. It's one thing to know that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. It's quite another to see the glory of God shine through in all of its radiance and its brilliance. So if you imagine for 
for a moment that you're Peter and you're seeing this. This man you have been hanging around with for the past three years suddenly has this glorious transfiguration, this major change on this mountaintop, this glorious shining moment where not only is the glory of God being revealed in Jesus, but he is standing next to two of Israel's greatest. He's got Moses and Elijah on either side, the great lawgiver, and the other prophet who used to go around raising people from the dead but was swept up into heaven. I mean, these were Israel's finest, and at first, no doubt, Peter thought he was standing in the midst of three equally important people. I mean, Jesus, yeah, he's great, but I've been hanging out for him, you know, with him for the past three, however many uh, years here. But Moses and Elijah, now that's something. So I can imagine Peter thinking, like, what do I do? What do I do with this? Oh, I've got an idea. Let's pitch a tent. Seems like a strange thing. But that's the kind of reaction we have when we can't know what to do when we're overwhelmed by an event. It's just, I want to do something. We want to do something. And in this case, he wants to do something that will mark the moment. So there's Peter thinking of the only thing he can do. Let's pitch a tent. Mark this spot as memorable in the history of the Israelites. Because that's what Israelites did when memorable things happened. Like when Joshua was crossing the Jordan River, he was told to take stones from the, Jordan, the bottom of the river so that they would remember that event. Or Jacob, when he built an altar after his uh, dream, the ladder with the angels up and down. It's that moment of remembering and marking an event or when Abraham would build altars every time he had an encounter with God. But just as he's suggesting this, just as he's suggesting it, let's, let's build these tents. There's this big, dark cloud that comes down. It stops Peter because there's this booming voice that comes out of this, this voice from heaven, which is repeating what God stated at Jesus' baptism. If you've kind of been um, here with us through this uh, time of Epiphany, Epiphany season started back in January with Jesus' baptism. Now here we are with him on this mountaintop, getting ready to go to Jerusalem. And here we have this voice again. Repeating, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Then he adds something extra. He says, listen to him. I really wish I had the Cecil B. DeMille voice or James Earl Jones or somebody because I just don't have the booming voice of God. <laughs> it says, listen to him. God's statement as Jesus stands in between Elijah, the greatest prophets, and Moses, the great lawgiver. God is stating, no, no, listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to my son. Because I'm sure Peter was thinking that Moses and Elijah were big deals. The voice from heaven says something different. Not denying that they're big deals in Israel's history, but Jesus, the Son of God, is the fulfillment of these prophets of this history, of the law, all wrapped up in this one with whom God is well pleased. Listen to him. Because Jesus fulfills all of that, all the law, all the prophets. Their time has passed pointing to the one who was to come. Listen to him. Well, during that whole listening thing anyway, I mean, we actually now have to pay attention to what Jesus says. Which for Peter, that is going to be really tough. Now, Peter was not that great of a listener. I'll just tell you that right now. I mean, whenever Jesus talked about dying, 
Peter was always like, no way, we'll never let that happen. In fact, in a scene right before this one in the Bible is when Jesus is asking Peter, well, who do people say I am? He says, oh, you're the Messiah. Jesus goes, hey, yeah, this is revealed to you from heaven. And then he says, now I've got to go and I've got to die. And Peter goes, no, you're not going to die. We won't ever let that happen. And Jesus goes, okay, get behind me, Satan. Two seconds later, get behind me, Satan. Because he's not listening, he's not paying attention to who and what Jesus is. Later he says, Peter, you're going to betray me three times. Peter goes, no way. <coughs> Wouldn't do that. But before we get too down on Peter, let's remember how well our listening skills actually are when it comes to the voice of God. Most of the time, what God has to say, we don't really want to hear. And we have that problem throughout the Bible. Moses, go free my people from the Egyptians. Uh, yeah, they kind of want me for murder. I don't think that's a good idea. You better send somebody else. Jonah, go tell the Ninevites to repent. Yeah, I don't like the Ninevites. I don't think I'm going to do that. Because I don't want you forgiving them. Go to seminary, Rebecca. <laughs> and 
die. And the disciples remained silent. Well, it says in Luke's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel says that Jesus orders them to stay silent because the focus was not on this moment. This was a glimpse, but this is not the focus. Something else has to happen first. Transfiguration will be remembered and it will be talked about after the resurrection because that is where he is truly glorified. Transfiguration, again, was just that glimpse of what is to come, of what exists. But there's a heavy road to go down before he gets there. And that, let's face it, that's our lives. We know there is that something wonderful. We see it. We catch glimpses of it. There's wonderful, glorious things that happen and that we have been given and that promise transforms and transfigures our lives in the here and now, or at least it should. But it's also with that stark realization that even though that glory is there, life itself is not always so glorious. And that sometimes we still have to walk down through those valleys. We have to travel there with Him, rejoicing in the glory of the transfiguration while also mourning the sorrows of a broken world and life. I like to think of us as being kind of like Moses and, and Paul, you know, when Moses came down, his, his face was so bright he put a veil over it, and Paul tells us, you know, forget the veil, let the light shine. When we've been transfigured, when we've been transformed by the light of Christ, that we let that light shine in this world, even when we're in those darkest valleys, let the light shine to give other people that glimpse and that hope of what is promised. So we carry that bright and glorious shining face that other people may want to put a veil over. The light of being transfigured by what God does in our lives as we wade through our lives to our deaths. And just like Jesus' glorious mountaintop moment was only a glimpse, we too have that glimpse to remind us that while, yes, we do have to die in order to be resurrected and raised to new life, we will be glorified and transfigured because in our baptisms, we're harking back to that baptism, in our baptisms, we are baptized into Christ's death and his glorious resurrection, which means we share in it. We share in it. It is not just a glimpse. It is the full, the real thing. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for the gift of revealing your Son to the disciples and to us. To remind us of your glorious nature. Help us to listen to what you are saying, how Christ is speaking to us in our lives, that we may do your will even when it is not our will. In Jesus' name we pray.